Hello, my dear colleagues from FAAPI. Welcome to this virtual edition of the conference. My name is Gabriel Diaz Maggioli, and I'm honored, extremely honored, to have been invited to address you today. And the topic I'm going to be discussing with you is basically trying to answer a question. What should count as assessment in English language teaching? In the next 50 minutes, I'm going to try and make the case for a reconsideration of our beliefs about standardized tests, particularly proficiency tests of an international nature, and also give you ways in which we can uh, revamp our assessment practices to make sure that what we are assessing is learning. And to get us started, I have selected two sample pieces of writing from two foreign language learners. I'm going to show them to you in a minute. I'm going to read them out loud. And while we go over each of the pieces, I want you to answer one question. These are two students, one male, the first one, one female, the second. Which of the two students deserves a pass? As you're reading their expressions, their written expressions, think about why you would or wouldn't give this person a pass, okay? And we're going to start with a typical uh, standard examination question of those very interesting topics that students like to write about. This was question number three. These two students answered the same question, question number three, in an international examination. The question was, what is the most valuable thing that you learned in school? And the instructions asked them to write between 100 and 200 words. Okay, let's look at how student number one responded to this question. I have made no changes to the way students wrote their pieces. Here's student one, the first part of the composition. I broke them into two slides so that it could be well read. This student who was a male wrote, the most valuable thing that I learned in school it's a very difficult thing to answer because I've learned so many stuff, but one of the most valuable things that I learned was to always move forward and never give up no matter how hard some classes can be. In a way, I can always try again and do my best, but what matters is that I don't give up. He continues, that is how I got out of school. I failed a few years, but I kept trying until I accomplished my goals. My teacher taught me that they always motivated me and showed me that I can do anything I want if I prepared myself to do it. In short, I learned a lot of other stuff like always to be a nice person, to treat everybody equally, to commit myself to my class, and that showed me how to commit. Okay. This is student one answering question three. What was the most valuable thing that you learned in school? Can we move on to student two? Student two is a female. And she wrote, the majority of us strongly believe that the best part of our life is when we are children and we only have to worry about meeting our friends at school. From my point of view, I really enjoyed going to school. I always have been a friendly person, so I had a lot of friends. Also, my teachers were the best. They were always helping me not only with the subject, but being a good person too. She goes on to write, it's not easy to learn how to work in a group. Sometimes you cannot do it without help. My teachers and my classmates teach me how to be an honest, patient, and reliable person. To sum up, 
Going to school is not only about doing homework and learn math and history. I have learned to be a good person, and it's one of the more valuable things. And I own to my teachers and classmates, I do treasure having this skill because a few people has the capacity of having actions from the heart. So, decision time. Who would you grant a pass? Student A or student B? Well, the truth is, these two students sat for the same standardized test on the same day, wrote the same uh wrote an answer to the same question, but there was a significant difference in between the two students. Student A is a polyglot. He learned English in an informal way, mostly independent. He independently sought answers to how I could learn this language. He had only studied English for six years in a public school. Two of those six years, he had no English teacher, so he didn't take the subject, but he was, was very motivated by the language and he learned by listening to the, to the radio, to podcasts or the radio, watching films and sitcoms and playing video games, online video games, mostly simulation games where they have to compete. And then he said, I looked at opportunities for learning the language, uh, for learning the language and to practice that language in real life contexts. Student B, on the other hand, studied English <clears throat> since the age of eight. At the time I met her, she was 18. She uh, had successfully attempted uh, to take one international examination at B to level and had passed it and was now preparing to move on to a C1 uh, level course to take a C1 examination. Her uh, goal was to take two more years of courses and take the C2 in the future. Now, what became really evident to me from what these two students wrote and I've done this exercise in this, this particular exercise of working with these two texts in uh, language teaching workshops. Um, what people tend to notice the most about student A is how disorganized his writing is, how plagued with all sorts of uh, mistakes this uh, writing is. And in the end, the tendency the majority of the people who read this would say, well, this person cannot pass. And there I direct their attention to the question that these students were trying to answer. What is the most valuable thing that you learned in school? His writing and his languages, even though not, not fully polished, is communicative. He discusses ideas and he attempts an answer to the question. Student two is the one who everybody says, I would give this student a pass. And here, let me draw your attention to some features. If you look at the first part of these students' writing, it's almost flawless. There are almost no mistakes. The mistakes start to happen in the second part of the composition. And what we see here is she has developed uh, fluency strategies to keep the writing going. She starts with a powerful um, first paragraph, which unfortunately, does not connect to the, to the question posed. 
She uses a lot of connectors from my point of view, comma, also comma, her punctuation is impeccable. And she goes on to uh, develop ideas. And then she pro provides a summing up. But if you read this in detail, and I invite you to do it as long as I speak, every paragraph deals with a different topic. And in the four paragraphs that she gives us, she does not at all answer the question, which was, what is the most valuable thing that you learned in school? So while everybody would be, would be amenable to give this student a pass, to me, it would be a fail. Why? Well, simply because, first of all, she didn't answer the, the question, so she didn't fulfill the task. And what we see here, particularly in the second composition, is a typical example of what is happening in our profession nowadays, and which is a huge cause course for worry, which is the negative washback effect that international standardized proficiency tests are having on how the, the way that our students give proof of their having learned a language. To me, student number two is the product of a very good training for the exam course, a very well articulated uh, writing as a product approach, where the formal elements of the text are in place. Uh, the paragraphing, the a powerful introduction, connecting ideas with logical connectors, etc. And in general, very good uh, language use at B2 level, B2 plus. However, the whole uh, right piece of writing does not hold cohesively through meaning. It's loosely connected to the topic of a school, but the person fails to answer the question. And another characteristic that we see in um, texts that have been produced by students who have been doing exam preparation classes for a long time is that in towards the end of the text that they attempted to write, their true uh, potential for language use is shown. So here is where most of the mistakes and the incongruencies with the, the task come up, surface, and are evidenced. Hence, <clears throat> I would give a pass to student A and not to student B. Now, purists in uh, language assessment might criticize me for this decision. After all, there's a greater level of control over the language in student B than in student A. So from the former point of view, she may score more points than student A. And what she did was, she just blurted out in writing chunks that she had memorized. So she may have written similar compositions and in a product, and this is evidently the, uh, the result of a product approach to teaching writing, <clears throat> where you work from a model text and students make minimal changes to that text so as to reproduce something in which the student's voice is not present. In, this, in the case of student B, her voice is not fully present. In the case of student A, A I believe his voice leads us. And we experience more feelings. We experience, we're closer to his experience than with student B. So why does this happen? Well, basically I'm using as a background, this beautiful, painting 
which was painted in 1838. And it's called the Great Wave. It's a very ubiqu ubiquitous painting in, in uh, art uh, studies uh, because uh, it's one of the first paintings, Japanese paintings, <clears throat> that actually uses the color blue, a color which was not used in Japanese paintings before because it was imported by Europeans. And the author created 36 representations of the Mount Fuji, which has a very strong symbolism in Japan. Mount Fuji, which appears at the end, is the, the symbol of knowledge, of wisdom, of permanence, of strength, and of tradition in Japan. Now, what this painting conveys is the rage of the sea. And this was painted in 1838, a time when Japan was slowly opening up. So the colors and the way things have been shaped in this painting show that the mountain becomes the wave and the wave becomes the mountain. Land becomes the sea and the sea becomes the land. But lost in the middle of this symbolism are barges, barges with sailors. So when we talk about why, why am I using this image as a useful metaphor for this presentation? Because we generally talk about the washback effect of testing over the curriculum and over teaching. And we know that there are, there, there's positive watch, washback effect but there's also negative washback effect. It is my contention that what has happened in recent years, and I can trace this to the last 30 years or so, ever since the late 80s, early 90s, this zest for accrediting language proficiency by sitting uh, for international examinations, has obscured what we used to be very good at doing, which was teaching English, teaching a language, a language which is a living semiotic system for the creation of meanings and has reduced most of the activities that we do, particularly in the more advanced levels of language study, though the lower levels are not devoid of the constraint, it has straight jacketed our proposals, uh, teaching proposals and learning proposals because of the focus on teaching for the exam and the exam being the only measure uh, that can determine whether somebody knows or doesn't know English. So in what remains of my talk today, about half an hour, I'm going to try and explain my contention and try to explain the theoretical perspective I'm coming from I'm trying, I'm also going to try and give you a few uh, ideas for thinking and perhaps engaging in exploration in the future. So let us get started with some questions. When I was invited to give this presentation and this topic was given to me, I sat down uh, before writing the, the outline of my talk and I said, okay, what would my colleagues be asking themselves about assessment. And then I went back to where I always go, to my conversations with my student teachers, with my conversation with colleagues, to what I say when I'm teaching about assessment. And this short list of questions came up as highly relevant and as good heuristics to organize our discussion. So what do, what do we mean by assessment? Assessment is a very polysemic term. It can hide all sorts of sins. But when we talk about assessment, what are we really talking about? And what does being competent in a language in this case really mean? And we cannot forget that competence, the notion of competence and competencies is inherent to the field of linguistics. The first one to come up with the idea of what a competence is was Chomsky in our field. 
when he established the difference between competence and performance. But if we go to that uh, origin of the concept of being competent means that you can perform according to standards. You can perform according to socially accepted ways of interacting with other human beings using a semiotic system called language, but also using other semiotic systems that significantly impact the way in which we convey meaning. So is learning the same thing as what appears as a test result? How valid, reliable, and authentic can we say that a test is given the results that we get in the tests and what we actually see learners doing? What is the effect of standardized tests on students, teachers, and institutions? And I'm not going to reveal any truth there. This has been an, a, a point of contention in assessment theory for many, many years. And then can, we, can tests give proof of students' actual learning? Are they the correct instrument to say a student has learned or hasn't learned? Wouldn't it be better to say a student is able to pass this test that requires them to know this knowledge or they cannot pass this test, but is that a fair expression to say, is this proof of the student's actual learning? And if the situation is as this, Malama, as I am painting it, and I know that I'm being pessimistic about this, are there alternative ways to provide accreditation for learning? particularly in the public school systems in Latin America, we see this push towards the learning of English starting at very young ages. We see in the infusion of funds and the creation of programs. And we are faced with the same complaints that we have been facing for almost a hundred years, ever since English started being taught in, in official public schools, students don't learn. And my question is, is it that students don't learn or is it that the instruments we're using to measure that learning are not the, other, the necessary or adequate ones? So if all this is a negative situation, why assess after all? I don't claim to have the truth uh, or the answers to all these questions. What I can only do is share my own appraisal with you, take you on a thinking aloud kind of stream of consciousness discussion based on these questions. And I would like to start by doing what they do in the sound of music. Let's start at the very beginning. As I said, the term assessment is very polysemic. It may admit multiple meanings, and most of the times, those multiple meanings uh, mean different things to different people. So what is assessment? I like to go to the etymology of the words, the origin of the words, because they tell us a lot about the, ori the origin of the concept, the original concept, and how it can conflict with current interpretations. To me, assessment is, is an umbrella term, an umbrella term uh, related to finding out what students learn. And the etymology of the word assessment comes from Latin, uh, the word assidere. Assidere means to sit with. So assessing means sitting with a student. What for? so that together we can learn. Another use, usual term we have is evaluation. And of all, of all the conceptions of the term, I like the French term, evaluer, evaluer. What does this mean? It means find value in. So evaluation is a way of discovering learning. How assessing, assessing in the ways that I'm going to discuss with you today. 
<clears throat> but if we just concentrate on the situation that happens in the use of standardized tests, we can conclude that they are not oriented to assessment and they are not oriented to evaluation either. It's not that they try to capture what students know, they try to capture their own ideation of the language. So there is no sitting with the student. And it's not about finding value in what the students know, it's about finding what students can do correctly or incorrectly. Nevertheless, because we, if we work in formal education, these are tools of the trade that we need to abide by. There's also the idea of grading. And the whole area of testing was born out of statistics. So when we grade, we tend to stick, or we tend, not tend to, but we were forced to stick to the conception of a normal distribution of the bell curve, where we have a few very bad students, a few very good students, and a whole bunch of mediocre students in the middle with different levels of mediocrity. And what happens is when your grades do not reflect that, institutionally, you are generally questioned. Have you ever had a, a, an evaluation instance where all your students passed? If that is the case, testing theory tells us that our test was uh, badly constructed. Now, <clears throat> if you give pass marks to everybody, your institution also questions you. You are the good teacher, the easy teacher. Now, a good teacher, and particularly in the southern cone of Latin America, a good teacher is a rigorous teacher. So I'm a math teacher, and you have all heard this. Um, 48 students sat for my exam, and only one passed. That's how demanding I am. To me, that's how, what a failure I am because I failed either to construct an instrument that would capture the reality of the students, or I simply haven't taught these students well. And the preoccupation that society has is with issues of accreditation and certification. And here is where these in international standardized tests have a role. They have the role to uh, make us accountable to society for our efforts. But that's the only use. It's a one-shot use that does not actually capture the richness of learning or the richness of the student's expression. So can we equate assessment, this asidere, with testing? Detail Herman and uh, Knuth in 1991 wrote this. Well, assessment has the potential to improve learning for all students, historically, it has acted as a barrier rather than a bridge to educational opportunity. Assessments have been used to label students and put them in debt and tracks. Now, it's surprising to me that this was written exactly 20 years ago today and that the situation remains unchanged. <clears throat> because if we look at the purpose of assessment, assessment as an educational endeavor, as an educational practice, the, in my humble opinion, the purpose of assessment would be to inform about current progress so as to improve learning and teaching. It's like taking the pulse on the learning of the students why? Because if it is too accelerated, we need to medicate the students, right? Well, not medicate the students, but medicate the person who has arrhythmia or tachycardia. So that is the purpose of assessment. And it's not to label, discriminate, provide tracking systems for learners. The other thing is we have to question what, what it is that we teach. And yes, there was a conception of communicative competence 
uh, Chomsky brought up the, the notion of competence versus performance. Canale and Sweeney in 1981 created this concept of communicative competence being made up of four components, linguistic, sociolinguistic, um, discourse competent, and some sort of compensatory competence, strategic competence that makes up for uh, breakdowns in the other three. So from that perspective, we look at one of these international standardized tests. Yeah, you could say they test communicative competence. But the concept of communicative competence has evolved over time. And given what we see now in terms of curriculum development, in terms of methodological trends, linguistic trends, I think that the Bachman and Palmer characterization of communicative competence uh, that they created in 1996 in a wonderful um, article on assessment is the, the one that sets the right tone for our discussion. These authors talk about communicative competence as encompassing two distinct competencies, organizational competence and pragmatic competence. The first thing that we see here is that it somehow it goes back to the notion of competence and performance. Because when we talk about organizational, it has to do with knowing about pragmatic competence means being competent in action. The organizational competences, no wonder, are comprised, the organizational competence is comprised of two sub-competences, grammatical competence and textual competence. And pragmatic competence is made up of other two, which are elocutionary competence. And look at everything that we have there is all the functions of language and social linguistic competence. That is this sensitivity to language variation. Now I ask you, when we look at the syllabi for these international exams, what aspects of this concept of communicative competence do they survey? My contention is not all of them. There are aspects of pragmatic, pragmatic competence that are not taken into consideration, I would say to the detriment of communication. But yes, you can see that the activities and the formats that most of these international exams exhibit cater only for organizational and competence. So if I, we make a comparison between this and the traditional concept of uh, communicative competence by Canal and Swain, we can say that these exams are mostly focused on what we used to call linguistic competence. So we need to look for ways in which we can assess something like this, the knowledge that students have, and also how they put that knowledge to use in real life. Bachman and Palmer. I have all the, um, the references at the end. We go to second language acquisition theory. That's another area we need to explore because in second language acquisition, the dichotomy between acquiring and learning has already been solved and um, it's water under the bridge. Uh, and the concept of um, language learning we have now has been termed instructed second language acquisition. So it requires different components to be able to achieve that communicative competence. But this view of language learning and acquisition is respectful of that communicative competence we've just um, uh, described. And I'm going to cite Ellis, and you're going to be surprised because this is from 2008, but these key ideas are still held as valid in the field. What he says is when we, lead, when we learn a language, we learn, learn both things, prefabricated chunks, and we also learn grammar rules. <clears throat> we learn through activities that should focus on meaning at all times, should focus on meaning at all times. And we learn 
when we have an opportunity to focus on form, to see how the form shapes the message. We focus on implicit knowledge without disregarding explicit knowledge. We take into account the student's inner syllabus. And this has nothing to do with the levels of the European framework. The student's inner syllabus is the normal pathway of the uh, development of languages from birth till death. And it's, it's, it's equivalent in, in all the languages and it happens. We come kind of pre-programmed to follow a specific sequence from morphine to words, from words to short phrases, phrases, well, well, you know what I mean. Now, for that inner syllabus to be activated and actually used, we need to exposure to a wide range of naturally occurring, occurring language. And that is what we generally call input. But look at the adverbs. Naturally, the adjective occurring and the noun language, naturally occurring language. We also need opportunities to, for the input to be transformed into output. And one crucial factor here is there have to be opportunities to interact with peers. Because it is very seldom that when we use a language, we do it in a monologic way. Now, if you look at most parts, except for the oral interview, most parts of the standardized tests we are discussing today are monologic in nature. Is a student alone uh, processing language on their own? Individual learner differences make a huge difference. And research has confirmed that one of the first things that gets affected by standardized tests is the power that individual differences have to inform learning. So Ellis concludes in, concluded in 2008 that effective assessment should analyze both free expression and controlled expression. That is effective, authentic assessment. Unfortunately, we don't see this in the international standardized tests because everything is scripted, everything is tied to a descriptor and if you stray from the descriptor, then the results are not valid. The effects of a standardized tests on students have been extensively documented. I'm just going to mention a few. The loss, the loss of learning time uh, due to test preparation, reduced content knowledge because we have to reduce what we are teaching a narrow curriculum to focus on tested standards, loss of curiosity and love for learning, harmful stress, stigmatization of students and schools. Ah, oh, that school, they never pass their tests. Oh, what did you get? You got a C. Oh, sorry, you didn't pass. What band are you? What band are you? And so what that does is it makes the students internalize failure. And when one looks at the expression of any language learner, isn't it amazing that somebody has been able to construct correct uses of that semiotic system simply by meeting with peers and teachers one, two or three hours a week? It's a little miracle what we, what we, um, what we have. And of course, what is most important is that these exams are used, these exam results are used as a measure of quality of teachers and schools. So the school culture is altered. Every theoretician, every pedagogue, anybody who works uh, on, the topics, on the topic of school management and effective classroom management, effective institutional management, agrees that a collaborative culture is what really promotes learning. Here, collaboration is many times broken based on test results, and based on competition instead of collaboration. 
But perhaps what is most serious about how uh, standardized tests affect students is that they fail to account for students who learn and demonstrate proficiency in different ways. Sorry. <clears throat> if we look at what people assume learning is. We have to say that learning is not test results. Here we have the curriculum. The curriculum in general is mandated. And that curriculum is the document that tells us what to teach, how to teach, and how to test what we taught. So the next thing that comes down from the curriculum is what we call the syllabus, which is the course. And that syllabus it's of course aligned with the curriculum and specifies what is to be tested. So we test all these things and it may happen, and generally it does, the teachers are not able to teach the whole syllabus. So the tests end up not covering everything the teacher could possibly cover. And because of that, they are not representative of what students have actually learned as a consequence of the course. So we need to think in other terms because this mirage that the key to success in the future is doing well on tests is just that, a mirage. So what options are there? Earl, in, back in 2003, has this wonderful quote. Uh, he says that over time, students move forward in the learning when they can use personal knowledge to construct meaning, have the skills of self-motivating to realize what they don't understand when they don't understand something, and have ways of deciding what to do next. Because of their final nature, these tests do not allow us to do that, do not allow students to experience that. So look at the differences between what we can call classroom-based assessment is this assessment that seeks to inform learning and teaching and standardized tests. Generally, when we talk about classroom-based assessment, we hear, oh, but that is not rigorous. It's not scientific. It doesn't use statistical measures. But not every single statistical measure is representative of what students have learned. It may be a measure of a grade, but not a measure of learning. And we know that useful assessment is by nature multidimensional. What do we mean by multidimensional? Assessment is a process that is developed alongside teaching. In a way, assessment should drive teaching and learning. So we have forms of assessment. We have assessment for learning, assessment of learning, sorry, which is the one that is, is um, um, summative, final, graded. That is a measure that we teachers need to have and that students need to have. But instead of using a norm reference system by which, oh, we know that a few students are going to do poorly, others are going to do very well, others are going to do in a mediocre way, what we do is we have criteria. We have criteria and what we show is how close or how far each of the student is from that criteria they need to fulfill. That implies giving them feedback, right? So even when we do summative assessment, graded tests, they should only be an indicator of positioning towards the goals. And I don't compare one student with the other as I would do in normative testing. I compare each student to themselves in a process of development. Then there is, of course, assessment for learning. And that is any assessment that is embedded in teaching that gives us on the point of need information about how students are learning, how much and how usefully. Then there is, of course, a hidden area of assessment or an ignored area of assessment, which I call assessment as learning, in line with some theoreticians. And 
As you can see there, it refers to self-assessment or peer assessment, which is in itself not just an assessment step, but also a powerful instance of learning because I'm able to look at inside myself and see and give uh, an, um, an opinion about my assessment. And that makes me more conscious of what I have done and what I would need to do. And last but not least, there is a measure of assessment that we teachers tend to use a lot, but we don't systematically think of it as one of the dimensions of assessment, and that is dynamic assessment. Based on the, uh, on the, on the theory of Levygotsky, this form of assessment is what we do when we teach students and we mediate their learning. We see what, how far they can go with assistance within the zone of proximal development. So a good assessment system that is oriented towards discovering whether students have learned should contain these four forms of assessment. And people have asked me, well, but is there any example? How do you do this in practice? Well, there is one example that I can think of, and it's something that has been called integrated performance assessment. It does not belong to the field of English language teaching. It comes from the field of foreign language teaching and learning. It's a development of the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And I define this as a form of cluster assessment. Cluster because assessment is clustered around logical modes of communication, which presents students with three contextualized tasks over three different lessons, each of which is intended to assess communication through one of the modes, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. Here we have what all the theory I have been discussing so far has told us, right? That we need to have the chunking, but we need to have access to the formal aspects of the language, that we need to learn from authentic texts, that we need meaning, that we need interaction, and that we need to ponder and balance both controlled and free. So an example of, uh, of how this works, it would be something like this. A student might read an authentic text on the importance of maintaining good health, that is interpretive communication. It could be reading or listening and does exercises with that in the first lesson. The teacher takes that uh, production that the students created, grades it and returns it to the student the immediately subsequent class. And based on that, they discuss what mistakes students make. And based on that, they go into what we call interpersonal communication. So what they do is after they've corrected the first part of the test, they have uh, they interview classmates on their views about good health or things that they do to keep healthy. Those are recorded. And again, the teacher takes them, corrects them and gives uh, some feedback to the learners. And in the third class, the teacher asks students individually to create an oral public service announcement with tips on how to stay healthy. That is a presentational mode. She could also ask them to write something, which is another way of using the presentational mode. The idea here is that everything is contextualized. There's one topic and one mode leads naturally to the other. Why is this a good option? Well, I would say because we, need, we have reached a point in the presentation where we need to think so why should I assess? In IPAs, Integrated Performance Assessment, captures the best of assessment. And because it's the students working together, the students working individually with the teacher and the teacher mediating and giving them feedback, that is the real concept of assessment. We sit there, we sit next to, and we evaluate what they do because we find value on what they've done. We don't just correct. And we should assess for different reasons. To me, if you're not assessing, then you're not teaching because teaching cannot progress without information from assessment. This form of classroom-based, more authentic, and more realistic and useful assessment provides a shift 
from accountability to improvement. And that is what assessment is about, making the lives of students and teachers better. Assessment improves student learning. We know this for sure. And you know what? When we use all forms of assessment that we've discussed, all dimensions of assessment, those students who experience the most learning difficulties are the ones who learn the most. Assessments are learning experience. Every time we do assessment of for us or dynamic for learning, that is in itself a learning experience. An assessment engages students in applying what they have learned. Feedback alone does not do it. The whole assessment process does it. And of course, it's true that assessment can improve student motivation, but more importantly, what I think it does is that it improves ownership for learning. So what can we conclude in terms of these international standardized tests, which have affected so much the culture of our profession? I think we are at a turning point and the pandemic has made this really, really evident that everything that can be measured does not always count. And what really counts sometimes cannot over, often be measured in that way. So going back to my two students at the beginning, which of the two? I would go for the guy with the broken language. I would go for the guy whose voice is made clear through a task oriented towards assessment. So I know I've covered a lot of stuff. I hope that some of these ideas have resonated with you. I look forward to being able to spend at least five minutes for questions and answer with you today and wish you all a wonderful conference. So I want to thank you very much for the invitation once again. Here is my bibliography. For those of you interested in the basis for this. So thank you very much.